But I want to get into the book of Romans. So if you have a Bible, turn to Romans. If you, are, if you have a phone and you don't have our app, you have to get our app. Here's why. Under the teachings, there's a, 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 a section for Romans. I've created a resource center for the book of Romans. Videos, commentaries, books, Bibles. To, to, I, I, there's a beautiful version of the Bible. Maybe you need to be re-inspired with how you even read the book of Romans. Get this one. It's beautiful. Um, websites with more teachings. Listen, if you're like, ah, Phil's mediocre. I gave you a website for so many teachings, you'll find something you'll love. But my goal is that as we go through the book of Romans, we're going to be changed. That's not a, a, a wish. That's a, that's a fact. But with that, I want you to have so much resource available to you. We've got videos available to go through it. So much available that you will, when we get through this letter, you're going to feel like, not that like you know it, like, oh yeah, now I know Romans, but that you just are inspired by this letter. I don't believe this is a book of the Bible you're going to walk away with by going, oh yeah, I get it now. I know it. I know it all. That's not how the Bible works. But you will certainly go away with saying, wow, I've been inspired by the grace of God. So I want to today do a brief kind of overview. And the reason for doing that is because I think that it'll help us frame kind of the, not, not really the direction, but just the importance of this book. So I hope it helps. Uh, so I, we're going to jump around quite a bit. If you're a note person, those notes are in that same section where the resources are, there's notes for the whole thing. In fact, all of my notes, almost word for word, are in there. So you can follow. So listen, if you just want to know when he's almost done, that's where you want to go. You want to go there and just track, and you'll be like, oh, Lord Jesus, he's not close. And then you'll pray, and then God will get me through it, okay? Uh, all right. Um, I'm excited about the book. Uh, I'm excited about us doing this together. Um, we're also, I should have also said this, Joy and I are working, and I mean mainly like Joy's going to be working on this because she's really good at this, is we want to create a little devotional as well that you can go through, not like personal notes as much as like how to read through Romans in the most effective way that we possibly can for you. But you cannot do this. You, you're not going to grow deeper by just resource alone, okay? You yourself need to read the scriptures and let God speak into your life. And a lot of what we've been talking about, in fact, I mentioned this last week. If you weren't here, it's okay. It's not okay. Where were you? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, last week I mentioned this, that discipleship is about digging deeper wells with Jesus, Discipleship, my definition of that, there's a lot more that could be said, but this is important. It's digging wells with Jesus. Meaning that it's like when life, you know, because life keeps moving and it gets harder and harder, and then it goes up and it goes down and it goes all in between, we need to have deeper wells that provide life with the Lord. But discipleship cannot happen through devotion or through Bible study. It Discipleship happens the exact same way that every healthy relationship happens, personal. And this always needs to be reiterated because it constantly gets lost in all of our, in our, in our society. It constantly gets lost. That Christianity is about an actual living relationship with God. You and God. Not you and your church. I believe in this, by the way, in a bigger way. Maybe, maybe more than I let on at times. I'm not a big believer in only the individual relationship with God. I believe that God uniquely brings us into community to benefit us and for us to benefit that community. It's a really important. But so is my individual relationship with Christ. People can be so biblically and relationally illiterate with Jesus. And they've been going to church for decades. You can go to church for decades and be biblically and relationally illiterate. The book of Romans is going to help motivate us towards a deeper connection to Jesus. The first time I ever heard about the book of Romans was at me and Joy's home church. At that time, it was Calvary Costa Mesa, where the founder of Calvary Chapel was the pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith. And we used to just, I remember sitting on the floor on a Sunday night uh, up in the front. Church was so full, and, and you know, they, we would sit on the front and uh, on the ground, and I remember him unpacking the book of Romans. I'd never heard anything quite like it. I didn't know there was a book of the Bible that just kept, it's just richer and richer and richer. 
and uh, I was just so blown away. There's so many books on this, on this letter, so many commentaries. Commentaries are just books written about the verses, okay? Um, so much. There's been so many influential people that were influenced by this letter. We'll talk about that in just a minute. This book is an unlocking book for most of the rest of Scripture. You want to really get the sense of what God's trying to say in the world, in every generation, the book of Romans will help do that. That's why I, for this first series of a two, three weeks, I'm calling it Unlocking Romans because this is, a, this is a beginning that really unlocks our concept for the whole thing. But the one thing I want you to really make sure you get, in fact, I'm going to put it on the screens here. This is so important. Are you ready? This book is about the gospel. The gospel is not information. The gospel, listen, this is so, it's so important. I wrote it down to make sure it gets on the screen. This is really important. The good news of Jesus Christ is not information. Now you're like, but it is information. Okay, you're right. It's not only information. Nobody has been born again by the information alone. The Bible even tells us in the book of James that the demons believe in God, but they don't have eternal life. So the, the information, and we live in an information age. We are overwhelmed with information. We are literally paralyzed by information. Our entire systems have been shut down simply. If you click one thing on social media, everything else will tell you the exact same thing and you'll never get it off. That's how much information. If you talk about it in your closet, Alexa will start talking about it. Siri will, Instagram will start pulling up ads. You're like, we should go to the Bahamas. Everything will be Bahamas in your house eventually. It's crazy. And yes, you should go to the Bahamas. Do it. Go for it. Okay. Hey, we're overwhelmed with information. And you know what it's doing to all of us? It's paralyzing us. It's not causing us to go, we feel more free. We feel more loved. We feel more connected. We're feeling isolated and alone and confused. Information is not the gospel, and the gospel is not information alone. It is the power of God unto salvation. And that comes through a living, actual relationship with God. I, I've said this before, and I want to connect this to our connect group things. We do on-ramps and off-ramps. I call them that. You know, have you ever gotten onto a freeway that you never got off of? That's what it feels like here at times. But uh, no, the freeway, you get on and then you get off, right? Right? That's the same with our connect groups. We do them for eight, eight weeks. The ninth week, we're going to do a fun worship night. Um, why? Why don't we just do them all the time? Why don't we just keep programs going all the time here? Let me tell you why. It's very simple. I've been doing church a long, long time. Joy and I have seen this for literally decades now. She's really young. I'm old, but she's young, okay? Here it is. You ready? You can become so attached to programs that you forget about a living relationship with Jesus for your life. I'm just not interested in being the program thing. I want you, I want to force me, and I want to force you and me into an actual relationship with God where we hear from God. And then we come together and we benefit from that as a community. I was talking to a friend right before the service, and he was telling me how, he, how I answered his question this last or a couple weeks ago. I answered his question, and I even used a verse that God had spoken to him the day before or so, and then a, and a, and another idea that I said in here that he was ha that the Lord was speaking into his life, and he's like, it's so great when, when God speaks through you for me. And I said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. God spoke to you already, and then he just let me be a part of confirming what he was already saying into your own life. That's when a relationship with Jesus is really exciting. Not when somebody else baby bird feeds you, but when you're hearing from God, and it's backed up by the things happening around you in your world. That's what I want to see happen for each one of us, especially as we go through the book of Romans. Now, the book was written by this guy named Paul. Not going to take a long time. He's also called Saul. Don't get caught up on the two names. Felipe? Phil. <laughs> Philip in Hungarian. You get it? Saul, Paul. We can make a big biblical thing about that, but just think he's a, he's a multicultural Jew who lived in a Gentile section, went by a Gentile name, but when he was connecting more to the Jewish world, he would go by Paul. Most believe that this happened, that he wrote this little book of Romans, little. He wrote this book of Romans 
when he spent three months in the city of Corinth. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to put a few maps up in just a second and because I, I want you to see what this guy was a part of. Paul was the first, what we would call, church planter. It's, we should just say church starter. The reason we say planter is because Jesus described the church as a living organism, so we don't like the word start. We use the word plant because it means it's organic and it's alive, but it's the same idea. Paul was the first church planter, really, who was strategic about moving around his world and starting churches. What does it mean to start a church? It simply means this. He went into a city. He would go into the synagogue because he was a rabbi, so he had that card. He'd walk in there and he'd be like, hey, I'm a rabbi. I trained with like the greatest rabbi, you know, living rabbi. And they're like, oh man, do you want to speak to us? And he's like, yes, I do. And then he would open up the scrolls and he would read and he would start talking about Jesus. And the same thing happened just about everywhere he went. People went nuts. They tried to kill him or they got saved. What a great reaction in life. If everywhere you went, people were like, I want to kill that guy. Or how do I become a believer? (laughs) It's a little daunting, isn't it? You're like, which one is going to happen right now? For most of us, it's like, hmm, that's interesting. For Paul, it was like, I want to kill you. Or, I'm ready to become a believer. And so he, he would share the gospel. People would get saved. And he said, hey, tomorrow I'm going to be in this place at this time. Come and join me and we'll talk about Jesus. Guess what? That's called church planting. That's how churches get started. Get rid of all the hocus pocus and the mumbo jumbo. It's you, dis- it's you sharing Christ. Somebody gets saved and you spend time with them in order to help them to know Jesus better. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. That's the church. It's not the buildings. It's not the formalities. It's people gathering around the name of Jesus. We're going to have church in homes all around the county of San Diego. We call them connect groups. Paul went on three journeys. Three journeys. Three trips that he went out that God called him to go out and he went out and he would plant or start churches in each one of those. Here's the first place that he went to on the maps here. By the way, you're like, oh, it's so small. I can't see it really well. Great. Go to the resource page. I'll give you the website where you can can look on these and zoom in and you can see it all. I'll shameless plug all day long. So go to that. It's a great resource, okay? But if you can see here, if you can see here, his focus was really in what we call, well, what was called then the Asia Minor. Today we would just say Turkey. He was focused in the area of Turkey, and he started these churches, and then he came back to his home place. He was in Antioch. Antioch was the sending church. And then on his second journey, God led Paul outside of Turkey and Asia Minor. For the first time, the gospel came into Europe. This is the first time the gospel came to Europe. And you can read about all about it in Acts 16. It's a powerful, powerful moment when the gospel moved across a continent And we can do the next picture in. It's a zoom in here. If you can see there in the very center there, there's a little city just below the word Greece to the, uh, a little bit to the west, southwest, is the city of Corinth. And Corinth was an important city in, in, in Greece, and it's still quite a beautiful, amazing place. This is the place where Paul wrote the book of Romans, where Paul wrote the book of Romans. But he did one more journey, his third journey, and let's see his third journey. His third journey was not a church planting journey. His third journey was like a, the best hits of Paul journey. It was the best hits. He was going around and re, you know, re-establishing, re-encouraging, just how are you guys doing? How's it going? And it was on this trip that God told him, you are going to be arrested when you get to Rome. You're going to go to jail And everybody kept saying to him, don't go to Rome, don't go to Rome. People were prophesying, don't go to Rome. God's saying that you're going to go to jail. And Paul is the first person in the book of the the Bible that gives us a really clear sense of something. Just because God is saying you're going to be arrested doesn't mean you have to do the opposite. He knew he was going to get arrested, but he also knew it was God's will. And guess what? You can thank Paul for going to jail because he wrote half of the New Testament imprisoned. Half of these letters we got because Paul went to jail. He had all that free time. Before he was busy. He didn't have any time. Hey, Paul, you want to write a book? He's like, when? When do I have time? And then God's like, well, I've got a plan for that. 
And then he's in jail and he's like, man, I got all this time. <laughs> Lord, I'd like to not have this time. Paul wrote this letter when he was in the city of Corinth. We have good reason to believe that. You can look at the notes. Romans 16 talks about a woman, Phoebe, who was from the church there. It says Centria or Kentria, but it's also the area of Corinth. And Paul, in the book of Rome, Romans, tells us why he wants to go to Rome. Like, what's his goals? What are his intentions? I'm going to put them on the screen and just be quick about this. Paul tells us that he wants to get to Rome. He tells us that so far he's been prevented from getting to Rome. He tells us that he intends to stop in Rome on his way to Spain. Paul had more places that he was planning to go to to share the gospel. And finally, he tells us that he's going to go to Jerusalem to deliver money to the poor. Why am I telling you this? Because this is a church that Paul did not start. Paul did not start the church in Rome. I know it is very popular, historical Roman Catholicism. I'm not here to knock on Roman Catholicism. They've done a lot of good for the world. But I'm here to say this. The idea that the church of Rome was built on Peter and Paul is not historically accurate. Though it is theologically accurate because of this letter. It's certainly theologically true, biblically true, teaching true, that Paul established the church in Rome with this message, but he did it for all of us. This book is, the, is really the, the, the ground zero of understanding the grace and the work of God in your life. It's literally the ground zero. And uh, so Paul did not start this church. It started sometime earlier if Paul wrote this in like the 50s, the church was started in the 40s, not the 19. We're talking the actual 40s, okay? And when he finally writes to them, it's an established group of people. They've been gathering together. Paul writes this letter and it, and it would become, within his own lifetime, listen, within the few years that Paul was still alive, this book would become a centerpiece for all Christians all around the Middle East. It was that meaningful that quick. The impact of this book has historically been unbelievable and unprecedented. I'll share a few stories. In the year 386 AD, so 350 years, 330 years after Paul wrote this book, there was a man, his name was Aurelius Augustinus. What a name. He was a North African professor who was living in Milan, Italy. And he was a part of a cult. He was a part of a cult. But he felt this deep conviction over his life. He was incredibly immoral, sleeping around with whatever he could sleep around with. He was not a good man. And it was a part of this cult that he was in. And he was feeling deeply, deeply like burdened and just like, my life has no value, no meaning. He felt just the end of it all. And he hears this little kid singing this song about taking up and reading, taking up and reading, just some, some song and in that moment, it hit him so hard, and God used that to speak right into his life and say, I want you to read right now. I want you to read. And so he's a, he's a professor. He, grabs, he goes in, and he grabs a nearby scroll, and the scroll that he grabbed was a scroll of the book of Romans. Because just from the sense of writing alone, the book of Romans was being transmitted all over the known world. It was a masterpiece of just writing so he grabs this scroll and he starts reading. And this is what he read. Romans 13, 13. Let us behave properly as in the day. Not in carousing and drunkenness. Not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality. Not in strife and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. Augustine, by the way, is his name. Augustine. One of the most influential Christian writers of all time. Paul Augustine. Augustine would later write this, instantly at the end of that sentence by Paul, a clear light flooded my heart and all the darkness of doubt vanished away. He was born again on that day. Went from cult to Christian. Went from immoral to immoral, but now a Christian and God began to work on him. We all want to believe he went from immoral to like totally moral. Uh-uh. If you believe that, then you're bummed at your life. Because you're like, why am I still struggling? Because everybody does. Every once in a while, we throw somebody up here who's got a great testimony of, I used to do this, and then the minute I gave my life to Christ, it all stopped. And we're all like, yeah! And then we're like, dang, that hasn't happened to me. There's a reason that dude's standing up there and not everybody else. Because we love those stories. 
But if I asked most of us to come up here, we'd be like, I've been a Christian for 30 years and I'm still struggling, but I'm pressing on. Does that describe any of you? I feel like you're judging me right now. Okay. Uh, the theme and the key to understanding the book of Romans is going to be found, and we'll look at it soon, it's going to be found in verses 16 and 17, but you're allowed to cheat because it's the Bible and you can read ahead on that. But I want to mention the next person influenced by this book. It was a German monk who we all know, uh, or if you don't, this is exciting, but his name was Martin Luther. Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a Catholic monk who was also, by the way, ironically, a professor like Augustine, highly educated expert in biblical languages and he was reading the scriptures and he began to realize that what he read in the Bible and the practice of his faith at that time were not in alignment. And he had been to Rome, the place where Paul wrote the greatest letter of all time, and he had seen the just abuses of, of what was then called Christian. You don't, we don't call it Roman Catholic because it was just Christian. It's just a Christian world and people dragging themselves on their knees up to the churches just to show that they're repentant because if you didn't do that, then you're not really repentant. And the idea that God sees the heart didn't seem to matter anymore. But Luther had been walking with God and trying to walk with God for year after year after year, but he felt so condemned. And then once again, he's reading from the book of Romans, verse 17, chapter 1. He says, in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And Luther read that and he felt even more condemned. He's like, the just will live by faith. I'm not just, I'm not living by faith. I'm going to hell. And as he wrestled with the text, God opened his eyes to see that what God is saying here and what is meant to be said here is that you can only unlock the righteousness of God through faith. You cannot be righteous on your own. That's what God's been trying to say to us in the book of Romans. The only way to access God's righteousness and God's eternal hope in heaven is through faith. You can't do it by your own works. Listen, let me just say this. We say it as a joke kind of here, like none of us could earn God's favor, but really we couldn't. But there's been a lot of people who really were a lot better than we are. And they couldn't earn God's favor. They couldn't earn God's righteousness and this so impacted Luther that he began to see the Bible in a whole new way and he began to read the Bible in a whole new way when you begin to see the 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 righteousness of God received by faith and not through the works that you do it changes everything about the Bible and then Luther's reading and he's like I think the church is wrong I think the church is wrong super popular today to say that I'm good with it. I love that people challenge. Sure, we should challenge. Back then, you get your head cut off for that kind of stuff. But he did it. And the world changed. Last person, John Wesley, one of my favorites. John Wesley, in the 1700s, was in college, he was in college with one of my favorite people, uh, or favorite, like, interesting, unique, unique peoples, all at the same time. John Wesley, one of the great hymn writers and church planters, and also George Whitfield, one of, a part of the Great Awakening here in America. Very flawed human beings, but also God used them in some very interesting way. They were at Oxford together, such snobs, but back then it was just Oxford. Today it's like, ooh, but... It was just a school back then. And they were, in a, they were in a club. They started a club. Listen to what Pharisees they were back then. You ready? They started a club, and the club was called the Holy Club. How would you feel if they walk up to you like, hey, do you want to join my club? What's it called? Holy Club. You'd feel like a total loser to not join, right? They started a Holy Club. And the whole goal of it was, we're going to discipline our lives to follow Jesus. That's all they were really going for. And John Wesley was so motivated and inspired by that time that he felt God was calling him to go be a missionary to this new place called Georgia. Not Tbilisi, Georgia, where Matthew's going, but the state of Georgia. He's going to go to Georgia, not a state at the time. And he feels like God's called him to go. And he goes to Georgia, and he was a miserable failure. You know what is so hard? It's so hard to be a missionary when you're not a Christian, Homeboy wasn't a Christian yet. It is impossible. I mean, I've, I've seen some bad missionaries, but non-Christian missionaries, that's the worst. 
He's not a Christian. And he leaves totally defeated and he goes back to England. And he's so defeated, he gets off, literally gets off of the boat. It's nighttime. He's so discouraged, just meandering, walking down the street. And he sees a church and he goes into it. And the church was a, it was a German descent church. It was a church called the Moravian Church. You're, there's not going to be a test, so don't worry about it. But he goes into this church and he's in there and he's listening to this guy butcher a passage of scripture. He doesn't know Greek. He doesn't know Hebrew. He doesn't understand the, the context. He doesn't understand the content. But this man says one thing that changes life. The just will live by faith. For the first time, John Wesley realized, I've been trying to live by works, my own work, and not by faith in God. And he was born again. And the story drastically, drastically changed when that happened. I want to I wanna get to, and I, I want to quickly go through something that is called, it's called the Romans Road. Anybody heard of the Romans Road? Where's all that? Where's all that? Yeah. If you're older, you heard of it. If you've been a Christian a while and you're older, you heard of that one. If you don't know what the Romans wrote, you're welcome. You're going to get to hear about it right now. But I want to say something. We, the Romans wrote is a quick walkthrough of several verses that lay out the gospel. Let me tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly of the Romans wrote. Here's the good. Very clear biblical context for showing you what it means to be born again. Here's the bad and the ugly. It began to be used like some recipe book. You just give it, and if people read it, then everything's going to change. The gospel is not information. The reason we call it the Romans Road is because it's a journey. You're learning and processing, and as you process, you have God's truth to help guide where you go next and how you step into life. But I love the Romans Road not as a recipe book. It doesn't work. If you shout a verse at a person that's not a believer, don't expect them to fall on their knees and say, what must I do to be born again? There's going to be more that has to happen. Life. Conversation. But this is a beautiful passage of scriptures. The Romans road. What is the Romans road? Well, it begins right here in Romans chapter 3. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. Everyone is turned away. There is none who does good, no, not one. All of us, all of us begin our, uh, 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 um, a, the question of God begins with us realizing we need him ourselves. The question of God begins with this, I need a savior. So what happens when I finally come to the place where I realize, wow, I need a savior. I need a savior. Romans 3.23 on the Romans road says this, for all have sinned and, oh, it's not, it's not up there, so just track with me. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is the conclusion of what it means for all of us. So I want you, and when we get into Romans 1, 2, and 3, I'm going to really hammer on this point. Because you see what happens is that I love to tell you where you're wrong. And, but don't tell me that I'm wrong. Right? That's the hard part for all of us. But Paul says this, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody, we're all guilty. There it is, there all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, what if somebody says this, and I've gone through this with people, they're like, well, yeah, that's cool. What do I care? What do I care that I have sinned? That's not the end, I mean, whatever. Well, Romans 6, 23 says this. Well, the wages of sin is death. You're like, oh, it doesn't matter that I've sinned. Yeah, but the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Who cares if I've sinned? Listen, remember when I talked about the paradigm shift from modernistic to postmodernistic? That shift includes people saying, who cares if I've sinned? Some of us go, oh, how dare you not care? And they're like, how dare you care so much? You're all living in black and white and I'm living in the gray. Well, listen, because the wages of sin is death. But don't worry, God's gift is eternal life. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, because God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Christ made a way possible for you and I to be born again. Sin is not bad just because it's like bad. It is destructive and it removes us from the presence of God. And because of that, God said, no, I can't let that happen. I am going to find a way. By my love, I will find a way. I will demonstrate through my love how valuable and precious you are. Great, now what? Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Well, 
If you're ready to receive the love of God, then confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the path that Paul takes us through in the book of Romans. And you're like, cool, we just did it. We don't need to read the whole book. I promise you, it's going to be a little bit more enriching and a little bit more than that. But Paul takes us through this beautiful thing that I like we call the Romans Road. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up because we're, we're about there. We'll close in a song. What I want you to do, and I, in just a minute I'm going to give you an a outline of the whole book, only just to kind of show you how kind of clean and clear the book of Romans is. But I want you to have those two main ideas really ingrained into you. Number one, the gospel is not information. Don't look for information to save you or to make your life better. Please don't. Oh, if I just read a little bit more, the reading itself is not the key. It's what God wants to speak into your life in that moment that will be life-giving. Do you understand the difference? If you read for the recipe, you're not going to really benefit from the book the way you're meant to or the Bible at all or even just relationship with God. You and I are meant to see that the good news of Jesus is not information. It's the power of God unto salvation. And the second thing is this, that it comes and it's received by faith. By faith. That's the story of Augustine, Luther, Wesley. I could keep going. There's more. It's all their stories. That, that it was by faith. Not by the works that they did, but by faith in God. So what I want to do is I'm going to put these up on the screen and these are in the notes. You got access to this just for the week. I mean, it shuts down as soon as I change it to the next week. So you'll want to grab that if you want it. But this book is about righteousness. So let's put this up here. It's about a right standing with God. So I want you to just walk through this with me. The first 17 verses is about being right with God. Verses uh, chapter 118 through 320 is about righteousness needed. We need to be righteous. Chapter 321 through 521 is about how God gives his righteousness to us. Chapter 6 through 8 are about righteousness being lived out in our lives and how impossible that is apart from faith in God. In chapters 9, 10, and 11, we look at examples of righteousness being rejected. In chapters 12 through 15, we see righteousness being lived out, being practiced. And then he has some final thoughts. Now listen, this is not a theology or some intellectual book. This is a book for average people like you and me who want to know Jesus in a deeper way and want to let him impact our lives. So I'm going to challenge you to, uh, it's not really a challenge, but it kind of is. They don't like the challenge. <laughs> It doesn't bother me. I care. It's fine. Uh, here's the challenge. Be consistent here on Sundays. We're going we're gonna to be banging through this book. You're not going to want to miss this. This is not some shameless plug. This has nothing to do with, I need people to come to church to make me feel better. We need this book together. We need this letter. It's impactful. Yeah, you can watch it later recorded, but, you know, be here. Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com give. Thanks for tuning in.